conference, which was a great success. And if you're interested in learning more about the conference and more about different components of IAW, I encourage you to go to www.investinwork.org to find out more information. And we are planning a book launch for later in the year as well. Um, this book will be comprised of about 60 chapters by different authors, offering research, best practices, and resources on workforce development. So this slide here uh, is telling a couple of stories, but two main things that I want to highlight here essentially. First, government funding for workforce de uh, development has uh, declined over the years, unfortunately, while the need has increased. And also, there's a real opportunity for employers throughout the country to partner with educational providers, be it community colleges or local uh, nonprofit workforce development training organizations to invest more in informal training for uh, populations that are in need. So now, the research. So, as you can see, uh, 2017, we were busy, uh, primarily the first half of the year. We conducted listening sessions all around the country, 52 uh, to be exact, and we did this in 32 states, and, and including Puerto Rico. Um, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, I apologize, but the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, our coverage is all of New York State, the northern half of New Jersey, Fairfield County, Connecticut, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. So, in 1913, when the Federal Reserve was created, the uh, geographies were a little unique, but we're not complaining about having Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, so, especially in January. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, so we were very busy. We reached over 1,000 workforce development leaders throughout the course of 2017 as well, so we were proud of that. And at these listening sessions, participants first identified the current challenges facing both employers and potential job seekers. And as most of you probably would not be surprised to hear, that many of the barriers were not skill related, um, relate, related to um, the difficulties that ex offenders have finding jobs, uh, let alone quality jobs. Uh, we've heard a lot about uh, addiction. Um, we were hearing a lot about the opioid addiction around the around the country right now, but there have been other uh, addictions throughout, long-standing addictions throughout the country that uh, some populations have been grappling with as well. Um, as it relates to transportation, um, in one of our listening sessions in Newark, New Jersey, um, workforce providers discussed transportation as a barrier for residents, not only to get to the jobs, but to get to the job training centers. So that's, that's a real issue. Um, and of course, this isn't just an urban issue, but it's, it's also something that's very pronounced in rural areas as well. And also, lastly, I'll just quickly mention technological advancement and automation's impact on employer demands and quality and quality of available jobs impeding economic mobility. So as for promising strategies, though the challenges discussed were vast, several promising strategies were identified for expanding and, and diversifying the pipeline of skilled workers and connecting these workers with employers. Uh, there's opportunity to align workforce and economic development efforts using sector strategies, broker relationships between employers and training providers. And here in my district, uh, in Rochester, New York, uh, we worked with what are called P-TECH schools. They're early high school colleges that go from grade nine through 14. And essentially, these students follow an employer-focused curriculum designed to teach professional and technical skill sets. And so the purpose for creating this workforce development campaign was really to address the skills gap issue that we were hearing in our district. I know my colleagues in other districts hear about it as well. So what we wanted to do is have these students create videos that highlighted in-demand, well-paying, middle-skilled occupations that are right there in the Rochester community. Because what you hear from the employers was, we have a difficult time finding workers. All simultaneously, the inner city neighborhoods and the rural communities have very high unemployment rates. So we were trying to make a, a, an innovative contribution to that space, and we're looking to branch out to other parts of our district with that, with that initiative as well. And so
so lastly, I will just mention opportunities for investment. In light of the labor market challenges identified and promising strategies discussed, participants were asked to explore specific opportunities for investing in America's workforce. The following themes were identified as areas in which additional financial capital could improve outcomes. So of course, core programs and services connect workers to jobs and intermediaries that connect workers to jobs and early childhood education. Again, just drawing from my district, uh, during our listening sessions uh, in multiple cities, we've heard that the development of talent pipeline programs and early career preparation for youth were mentioned as areas of greater need in terms of investment by employers, by the uh, training providers and funders. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to my colleague, Jason Keller, who will talk about the linkages between CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, and workforce development. Thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Keller. I come from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. Uh, we are located very much in the central of the country, central portion of the country, but our district is unique in, in that we have both a very nice combination of urban and rural markets. So I spend most of my time in Illinois, but we also have uh, coverage in Iowa, Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Uh, so before Mark's opening comments this morning, how many of you knew a little bit about CRA? Okay. Uh, how many knew a lot about CRA? Uh, how many would like to know more about CRA? Yeah, that should be everybody's hand in some form of uh, So I'm here to boil down uh, a five and a half hour training session into seven slides. Uh, so I'm going to talk fairly quickly, but try to make CRA understandable to the audience. Uh, because I think, I describe a, a CRA a little bit like poker, where it's a minute to learn and a lifetime to master. Uh, CRA is not a checklist. Uh, it is a playbook. It is a, a group of, of ideology, or ideologies and thoughts that, that bring together what financial institutions are not only charged with doing, but I will tell you and be very honest that financial institutions need partnerships. They need opportunities to engage with the community and the people who live there. Uh, how many bankers do I have in the room? Okay. Uh, bankers uh, specifically uh, are also very much interested in this, and I don't know one banker who isn't interested in at least talking about a given set of strategies or a strategy. Uh, it may not fit within their purview for the year or the month or the quarter or whatnot, but the idea is that CRA can very much be explored in a lot of different ways. So again, just going to try to uh, rifle through these slides. So uh, as Mark had mentioned, federal law uh, passed in 1977. CRA is 41 years old. All right, there are some challenges uh, with CRA now that we may get into a little bit later, but the idea is that the, the core definition still remains. It encourages banks to meet the credit needs of the communities that they serve, uh, including low and moderate income neighborhoods. I will tell you that CRA is colorblind. CRA is not interested in race. CRA is not interested in gender. CRA is not interested in veterans. CRA is not interested in people with disabilities, uh, people uh, or, or seniors or, or youth in, in certain perspectives, CRA is solely focused on low and moderate income neighborhoods or low and moderate income people who live throughout the country. Uh, and this is where some of the modernization uh, may come into play as we go forward, but the idea is that CRA is income focused. So while it was birthed out of the redlining uh, phenomenon and the illegal credit practices that were happening at that time, CRA should be, and I repeat, should be taken in conjunction with the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, the Fair Housing Act, Truth and Lending Act, and other ways that, that uh, individuals uh, in the past may have, and in some cases are still illegally discriminated against. So be mindful that CRA is one, uh, one regulation that I see as part of a toolkit that can be replicated all throughout the country. Uh, I do want to also say that CRA uh, has to be, any loan, investment, or service that a bank is going to get involved with has to be safe and sound. CRA can be philanthropic, but it is not philanthropic by definition. There is not a pool of funds that banks have that say, well, we're just going to give this away. Banks are very much want to be corporate citizens. They want to be engaged in the communities that they serve. But again, the, what, what they're looking to do is get involved with organizations, community groups, action coalitions, block groups, anything that's out there in the field. But it has to be safe and sound. 
Uh, and this last point, which isn't regulatory by definition, is that CRA is collaborative, innovative, and relational. Again, uh, banks are looking for those partnerships out in the field to be able to make CRA move forward. So the CRA, uh, a lot of different things that, that, it, that it could be, but I want to focus on this, the regulatory definition of community development. And you're going to say, well, you know, Jason, I'm, I'm not in regulation. Uh, I may work with my local bank. Uh, I, I don't know what it is they do with the money I give them. But the idea is that from a community development perspective, these are the four categories where things like workforce development can fall right in line. Uh, the first one is around affordable housing. I think that's basic blocking and tackling of what CRA was intended to do in 1977. Still prevalent in every market that we look at here across this country. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many of your markets could use more affordable housing? Okay, all the hands should go up. That's still very much a need throughout this country. Banks should still be seen as, as partners within the affordable housing space. And right now in workforce development, we're seeing anchor institutions, hospitals, uh, uh, large universities and colleges, even some employers saying, we want to be able to help our employees find quality, affordable housing. This is where workforce development and workforce development strategy could come into play, but we'll get into a little bit more detail about that as we move forward. Uh, the next one is around activities that revitalize or stabilize low or moderate income geographies, distressed or underserved non-metropolitan middle income geographies, or designated disaster areas. And we're, we have a whole segment in the next breakout around disaster areas, but what this is saying is that CRA can be, can be a, an active tool within all of your markets because I guarantee you, in most of the places that you all come from, all of these activities would apply in some form or fashion. So understanding CRA, or at least the basic core principles, is something I'd advise you to do. Uh, the next bullet is activities that promote economic development by financing small businesses and small farms. So even though we're sitting in an urban market, I, I want to emphasize that small farm lending is very much a part of CRA as well. Uh, also, show of hands, how many of your markets could use additional small business loans? Again, you're going to get a consistent answer from every market that we come from that more small business lending is needed, and this is where CRA can be a valuable tool. Uh, this last bullet is community services that target lower moderate income individuals. And, and services uh, are, are really broken up into two components in the regulatory procedures. Number one is the retail service test. This is where banks have their physical branches or ATMs. Uh, what are their hours of business? What kind of products do they offer those, in those branches? Uh, but the second component, which is I, where I really think CRA uh, is moving forward, is within the CRA service test. So this is where bankers, it uh, doesn't matter if you're the, the newest teller or the newest administrative assistant, all the way to the senior vice president, uh, president of the bank, or, or, or you serve on that board of directors, where bankers donate their hours, where bankers serve on board of directors, where bankers are engaged with community groups, action coalitions, government subcommittees, where they're using their financial expertise, this is where you all can partner with financial institutions. There may not be a dollar threshold associated with their participation, but they are rewarded, they are incentivized, they are encouraged to donate their time, to give their time on behalf of the bank. So again, all of your markets have financial institutions in them. Uh, we're gonna go into the last part of the presentation around kind of what, what you can do as you, as you walk away from this presentation, but I do wanna emphasize that banks can be partners, uh, they can be involved in your entities and your organizations, without necessarily providing funds. They're looking for those relationships first, and more times than not, dollars will come, but the relationship is where they're going uh, initially. So what is the definition of economic development? Uh, the, the, there's really a two-pronged test here. Uh, the first one, and, and this is specifically uh, around businesses, activities must finance entities that meet the size or eligibility requirements of the SBA, uh, technical <coughs> or have an gross annual revenues of a million dollars or less. So any business, any business, whether it's the largest business in your community or the smallest business in the community, if they're creating jobs, if they're generating jobs, if they're helping to retain jobs, workforce development strategy and partnering with CRA can, can help financial in institutions meet that mandate. Uh, the second one is around the, the, the purpose test, and this is activities that promote, again, permanent job creation, retention, or help low and moderate income people or areas of redevelopments by federal, state, local, or tribal governments. What this means in plain English, that if, if there is a market within, uh, an area within the market that you serve that is a, a targeted redevelopment zone, an enterprise zone, uh, how many of you have heard about the new opportunity zones that have come out of the Trump tax plan? All right, so opportunity zones that are, that are gonna be federally or state designated, 
This is where CRA can be a real value uh, partner as, as, as some of these dollars uh, move into these communities. So again, just understanding the basics. No one in here is gonna be a master of this, but the idea is that if you can talk to your banker and, 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 and start to speak some of the language as that bank does, it will help your cause as you move forward. So moving on specifically to workforce development, I think, I think Mark and Tony said it, set the stage very nicely for the slide. Uh, it's almost as if we coordinated this presentation in advance. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, the idea is that workforce development specifically comes now in ju the July 2016 questions and answers. So CRA itself hasn't really changed since 1977. What has changed and what will continue to change are the questions and answers that implement the right. This is what the, where the consistency comes from uh, across the country. And in July 2016, there were a whole lot of uh, other changes uh, just for uh, clarity purposes, uh, broadband internet is now included in CRA. Uh, the idea of uh, removing digital deserts for both urban and rural markets, I think, cannot be included. Uh, another big one is around the physical infrastructure, uh, looking at stormwater treatment and other sewage treatment and helping bring back main streets across the country. Uh, and then this big one, this big round one around workforce development, and I won't read this to you verbatim, uh, this is again out of the CRA Q's and A's, but uh, 12, 12, uh, point 12G-1 and 12T-4 essentially now say that banks are, uh, can, can get CRA credit for the work that they're doing in workforce development. So this was always implied sort of under the job uh, creation and retention element uh, that's been in CRA a very long time, but now specifically workforce development strategy. So again, Jeannie's gonna walk you through some actual examples of how this may work in the field, but know that, that any banker uh, that is, you're gonna talk to about this and they're gonna say, well wait, uh, you know, we, we don't really, we're not engaged in workforce development. Well, you can be, and understanding the basics of this uh, would help you in that discussion. Uh, one thing I did want to share with you here uh, is there was a framework document, uh, and uh, we, we hot linked it in here, but if you just Google a framework for meeting CRA obligations, uh, this was published by the Federal Reserve Banks of Kansas City and Dallas. Uh, I'm a reviewer on this, not an author. Uh, but this is where uh, banks of a certain size, uh, their strategies in here are how banks can become engaged. Uh, and, and here's just, a, there, there's multiple pages on this and we don't have time to go into it here, but I just want to summarize uh, these four bullets for you very quickly. Uh, banks under workforce development strategy can lend to CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, uh, CDCs, uh, Community Development Corporations, or community-based organizations, CBOs, that engage in workforce development efforts. So notice the first word here, ladies and gentlemen, is lend. When a bank lends, it has a rate of return. And yes, banks are in the business of making profit. And they should, because when a bank makes profit, it can turn that money into other good for the community. And where does it get the funds to do this? Our deposits. This is the other really neat part about CRA that I should have stressed at the beginning. CRA is one of the few banking regulations that's public. All right, you can go out right now and find out your bank's CRA rating, either the bank you do personal business with or the bank that your entity does business with. And if that bank's CRA rating isn't um, uh, cutting the mustard, if it, isn't, if it isn't where you want it to be, you have the ability to organize, to protest, to be able to pull your funds. Uh, if, you, if you work for a state or, you, or municipality, you're part of a black community, you can organize that, that to, to be able to help use those dollars a little bit more effectively. This is where the public element, this is the yin and yang, the give and take of how CRA works. Uh, the next bullet, providing financial support through an investment, equity, equity equivalent, or a grant. So this may, may be where a bank uh, commits a certain amount of dollars to a uh, workforce development program, to a community college that's engaged in workforce development. Uh, it can also get CRA credit for investing in private companies that are, that are doing workforce development efforts help lower moderate income people move to that next level. So this idea of, of taking a low income person and giving them the skill set to become moderate, moderate to become middle, middle to become upper, to, to a little bit, to a certain degree, but again, with that CRA focus on low and moderate income. Uh, offering learn and earn opportunities, this can be in the form of apprenticeships, other accreditation models, or gets, getting people to, to have a certain set of skills to be able to contribute uh, to their community. And this is the last one where I mentioned briefly earlier, uh, to serve on a board uh, of a workforce development entity, volunteer at an entity, or offer pro bono services. So these pro bono services might be in the form of giving you uh, space within their office to help you with during tax time, to be able to, again, serve on, on a finance committee, 
But uh, I do have to advise though that banks, in order for them to receive CRA credit, their service has to be in a financial service capacity. So if they're just gonna help you do a fundraiser or, or a bake sale or, or buy tickets at a charity golf outing, that isn't necessarily CRA. They have to be using their financial expertise to move the needle from a workforce development perspective. Uh, how can banks engage in workforce development in initiatives that serve the needs of LMI individuals? Uh, this is where banks, again, the customer, just uh, again, by show of hands, how many of you are engaged in some form or fashion in workforce development? Uh, so he, here's some things that banks you can walk in and talk to your banker about after you leave this event. Uh, offering financial education to your clients, specifically being uh, that lender or server of or, or offer services within that bank. Uh, providing meeting, meeting space or other administrative support. And uh, I like this third bullet because this came up in, in, in the session this morning. Banks can serve as mentors or coaches on resume writing, interviewing, professional skills or career planning using that financial expertise that they've developed as that anchor within that given community. Again, it doesn't matter from a regulatory perspective if they're the, the newest teller, if they're doing something, uh, or newest, newest administrative assistant, if they're doing something on behalf of that financial institution, that is CRA. Uh, and and I, I wanna close by uh, leveraging the existing sector strategies. Uh, banks uh, are incentivized to, uh, incentivized to be innovative, to be first to market. Uh, so if you have an opportunity that no other bank is engaged in, these are the ones you want to approach, approach your banker with. But banks don't have to innovate for the sake of innovation, all right? Again, they still, anything they do still has to be safe or sound, has to be in good fiscal condition, and in some cases has to be approved by their board of directors or, or some subcommittee. But they can leverage existing sector strategies. So the example that I use on this is that, well, I, I, I work with a bank, my bank is, is only uh, in, in mortgage loans. Uh, they, they only do home, home mortgage lending. Um, so they're not engaged at all in workforce development. They don't do anything in workforce development. And my question back to that individual is, well, I, I bet that they do. I bet as they go through and look at those individual applications for individuals applying for home mortgage credit, instead of just jotting down what that individual does for a living on that standard 1003 residential loan app, having a little bit more understanding of what that individual does, what income they bring in, what, what market that individual works for, even reaching out to that employer to try to be a, a source of strength. There are ways of using workforce development that helps everyone that is just, you, you may find a new connection just based on what that loan officer is looking at or that underwriter is looking at for one individual mortgage loan now. You can start that small. This is where a bank can leverage its existing strengths as a strong home mortgage lender and offer home buying counseling, Think about financial literacy. Right now here in Chicago and nationally, uh, the Federal Reserve in Chicago is leading what's called Money Smart Week. Uh, we have operations uh, where there are sessions being held, thousands of sessions free of service happening right now. Uh, that are all, it's all about financial literacy and banks that are engaged in that financial literacy component. Uh, again, CRA eligible, but the idea is that there could be a workforce development spin to that. So uh, with that, I will turn the podium over to Jeannie. Uh, Jeannie will walk through some information about, again, how can you uh, specifically partner uh, and think about the role of black communities. Show them what the milestones 
uh, this day we are going to train uh, this many adults in these activities. Banks really need metrics uh, when they're working with CRA to show the examiners when they come in. So the more metrics you can provide up front, um, the easier it'll be and potentially more viable the uh, project will be. You want to be very specific about articulating how the funds are going to be used. Um, and by that I mean if you're asking for um, funding for uh, an adult workforce training program or a small business uh, revolving loan fund, you want to talk about how, how much funding you need over what period of time, how, that, how is that going to benefit the financial institution. Um, we have a very successful uh, community development financial institution here that works statewide. It's called the Carolina Small Business Fund. It's a CDFI. Um, it used to be the Minority Economic Development Fund, actually based right here in Durham. As it evolved, it's been lots of small business loans. It's, it's had appropriations from the legislature, it's, it's got funding from banks, foundations, just a great pool. One of the things that Linwood Long, who runs that CDFI, does really well, is he is able to just very specifically outline, you, Bank X, this is how you're going to benefit from this. We're going to do loans in your assessment area. Uh, we're going to do loans for startups. We're focusing on this type of business that the state needs in its business sector. So be very specific about benefits and impacts for the financial institutions. And as a result, he gets a tremendous amount of funding from that. Um, you also want to talk about um, your organization and you want to talk about the geographic area. So it might be loans or it could be training to low or moderate income individuals as Jason mentioned or it might be those individuals that live in a geography but being able to count that show the census tracts show what the income levels are show what those people are that you're going to serve in that project that's going to be very helpful to the bank again in terms of thinking about it with CRA um, you also want to promote your project as something that could be um, integrated into that financial institution's business plan. So if you know the financial institution, their sweet spot is small business loans, you probably don't want to go to them with a broadband infrastructure project. They, they, may not, they may not be up to speed on that, but you would go to that institution about small business. Um, if another institution is pretty open, they do some housing, they do some small business, you've seen some community facilities they've done and they're viable for a workforce, then you want to go there. But you want to do your homework about that financial institution so that you can explain how your project fits in to their plans. They do a strategic plan. Um, they do all types of planning in their assessment areas for CRA. So the more you can take your idea and your project and fit it into that plan, again, the more viable it's going to be. Um, Kind of continuing on about communities, um, think about if you, how many of you um, are associated with a nonprofit or are a nonprofit? Okay, so a pretty good number. Um, and you might be serving a geographic area already, you, you are, but you want to think about what are some of those least served parts. One of the things we talk about in community development with the Federal Reserve is we talk about low and moderate income communities, we also talk about underserved communities. So you might look out, I'll give you an example. Um, Mecklenburg County in North Carolina um, has some areas in it that are certainly low and moderate income. As you move north in the county, there's a lake called Lake Norman, there's some communities there, um, higher income communities. But there are areas within those that are low and moderate income individuals. Um, one particular place is in Davidson. Um, they're actually working through something with affordable housing right now. So if you can look out to those underserved areas, that might be a great place for you to pair up with a bank. And you may not run into as much competition as some of the other service areas that your organization is looking at. Um, if you can, other government programs are often good resources that can help manage and mitigate risk. So if you're in a rural area and you're already teamed up with the U.S. Um, Department of Agriculture, maybe with their business and industry program on some small business issues, that can give you that um, reputational and financial boost that would get a financial institution to take a look at you. So look at your portfolio, maybe you've got a foundation um, that's investing in you 
and see what things you can use to leverage um, the interest from that bank with CRA. You'd also want to compare and contrast products and services um, offered to the needs of the area. So you may come up with something that, that a bank could do, um, for example, under the broadband provisions um, of CRA, which couples nicely with workforce because we need that high speed access. You might um, be able to entice a bank to look at some of the financial um, programs that they offer online. So maybe you've got an area where branch banks are leaving and so you've got a, a lull in branch banking, but you could team up with that bank on some of those services they provide on, online. And that might be a great um, way to get their attention on some CRA projects. Um, also, um, pools of funds available for the CRA qualified grants, they're limited. So you know, banks have a limitation as to how much they can do. Some of them are thinking about this 24 to 36 months out, some of them even longer. So as Jason said, it's a relational issue, but it's also long-term. Um, so you want to, don't go to your financial institution and think, boom, I'm going to show you a project. It's going to be a CRA project, and we're going to do it in the next three, three months. So you want to think long term. Um, you want to get in front of them and realize that they're listening to a lot of people in a lot of different areas and that they're allocating uh, pretty far out. Um, as I mentioned, um, metrics are important, and so is how you present those uh, metrics in terms of written documents. Um, so metrics, um, descriptions of the area, certainly descriptions of the projects, but how many people is it going to serve? What's the time frame? Um, what, what's the dollar amount you're looking for? And then you, you can tell a story. We, we tell the banks that they should craft the story. There's something called performance context where they describe an area, they tell a story, and then they tell the examiners what they're going to do. You can do that in your correspondence as well. Um, if you live in southern Alabama and there's no broadband access, you can you need to weave the story about what's going on in southern Alabama without that broadband access. People have to travel to do this. There's a um, lack of branch banking. They need to do this. If the bank came in, offered these services, this is what we'd be able to do. So don't be afraid to uh, tell your story and articulate how your organization can meet that community that would not otherwise be met. So don't be afraid to say, like my friend Linwood says, if you don't give me this money to support the small businesses in the state of North Carolina, we're missing out on 20,000 people starting a small business. And we know that they're the backbone of the economy. So make sure you articulate that you've got a niche to fill, and if you don't fill it, that need's gonna go unmet. Um, and also remember, some financial institutions might be willing to participate even if they're not going to get CRA credit. credit. Sometimes there's you know, a question mark for them. I don't know if, I, if the examiners are going to consider this for CRA, but this is such a great project. Um, it has great civic and corporate goodwill. Um, they might fund it out of marketing funds that they have at a regional level. They might um, switch you over and let you talk to a foundation. A number of financial institutions have foundations. So just because you don't know if it's going to meet the CRA, um, should not hold you back from presenting it to the financial institution. There may be some other um, pathway for it. Um, so a couple of uh, tools for you to think about, because I know you're probably wondering, well, you know, when do these exams occur, and how do I know like, where a bank is in this process? Um, you can take a look at all three banking regulators, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, and the OCC, and I, I think the make this available so you can click these links. Um, you can take a look there and you can see when the CRA exams are um, targeted for your area. So you can target the banks then based on that timing. Um, you, you can certainly ask the bank that this is a good resource for you to um, take a look at and see who's where in their exam schedule. If you don't have a contact, and I'm sure you all have banking relationships, um, and you should start with your banking relationships, but if you don't know a contact on the CRA side, you know, reach out to a CRA officer. Um, if you can't find a CRA officer, I would say my colleagues and I are great um, resources for you to contact. You can find us on the Federal Reserve um, pages. Um, if you can't find them, you can find me at richmondfed.org. Uh, my email address is on there under community development, and I'll help you get to the um, right place in the Federal Reserve so that we can connect you with someone. Um, as you work through this process, um, 
um, don't hesitate to give positive and negative feedback to the regulators. Um, we're interested. Uh, we want to hear about the experience. We want to know what we can uh, do better. Um, so we've got a link here where you can um, give us feedback. You can certainly do that by email as well. Um, so in summary, I would just say to understand the financial institution's needs, you want to be a strategic partner. You want to go in with a project that's targeted, exactly how the money's going to be used, what the timeline is, how that matches with your organization's strengths, and how that's going to meet the needs of the community. Um, you want to target that investment, that loan, that service, whatever it is, to those low and moderate income individuals um, or the geographies. If you've got an idea for a workforce at a school, go and look up the information about that school. If you find that it has 57% uh, free and reduced lunch, you're going to be targeting low and moderate income children in that school. So there's some good indicators like that that you can use to make those targets. Um, and then you also just want to make sure that, in general, you're looking at community development goals and objectives. What does the community need? How's the bank?